William, your videographer from Two Hacks Publishing. Welcome to the College of Complexes being held at Barbex Restaurant at 8949 Garland Road, Dallas, Texas. Gently embracing the east side of White Rock Lake. When I entered, I was greeted like coming home to Grandma's house. Warm and friendly. When visiting the Barbex Restaurant, tell them you want your reservations for the next College of Complex class. Well, uh, welcome to the College of Complexes. This is our 252nd meeting since we started in January. No, we started in February of 2009. We put a different speaker on every week, a different subject. We require our speakers to take a position on an issue or express a point of view. They have to be for or against something. We don't care what it is. We give an hour to make a presentation. If they go over an hour, we cut them off. If anybody interrupts the speaker, remind the interrupter that we listen to only one fool at a time. That's one of our rules. And then we have questions and answers, not speeches. And we have questions and answers from the audience to the speaker, not speeches. And then we have remarks, rebuttals. Everybody in the audience that wants to gets five minutes at this podium to respond to what the speaker said for or against. And the speaker gets the last word, gets a comment and a comment and close the meeting. That's how it works. Uh, we don't pay our speakers, we give them a free dinner and our guests with our compliments and we charge everybody $3 so we can pay for the speaker's dinner and the advertising. We don't make anything, we have a lot of fun. Tonight, we, uh, it's the last meeting of the year, so we have, uh, we can't make everything free, but we've got free cake. Uh, there's a Black Forest cake there, so everybody will have cake that wants it, so save some room for dessert. There's also a Italian, what is it? Cream cake. Uh, if you like that, if you don't like the Black Forest cake, or you like them both, uh, whatever, it's there. And uh, we'll have that uh, probably about the time we, uh, when, uh, when it's rebuttal time, that'd be the time to do that. So eat up and then uh, save some room for dessert, you'll like it. Anyway, uh, now is the time for, for announcements. Are there any announcements? Anybody have any announcements? Now's the time to do them. Here. Carolyn, come on up here. Oh, God, I Yes, you do. I'm standing in for Margaret tonight. She's having her annual Christmas party. You can't get you on the... Hold on. Everyone is invited. Come on up here. We like you up here. You can't get away from Everybody's invited. You just have one request. Don't leave the flyers here because somebody she's never heard of. Thank you. It's on Turtle Creek. Turtle Creek, her house. Any other announcements? Anybody else have an announcement they want to make? Now's the chance. Now's your chance. Any announcements? No? Okay, next week, uh, the, the next two weeks are Christmas, so we will, Christmas and New Year's, there'll be no meetings because half the people here will be going somewhere else doing some other things. So we'd have an empty place. So we won't have meetings. The next meeting is January 3rd. And at that time we have, uh, Mike Goose, he's a speaker, writer, pluralist, activist, the first Muslim and perhaps the first Jewish, non-Jewish person to commemorate the Holocaust. And his, uh, his thing is on a much better tomorrow, so it ought to be interesting. That's January 3rd. It's on your itinerary there. I'm not going to read all this. January 10th, we have Can We Change the World with Power of Our Minds? That's a Pat O'Connell, she's sitting out there. She's our speaker then. She will be talking about that. It's on your itinerary. Look it up. 
And on January 17th, uh, joining the math revolution, no pencil, no paper, no calculator. Ken Kenneth Everett, he'll be here doing that. And February 7th, we have Judge Martin Hoffman, 6th District Court. He's going to be talking about expanding judicial foreclosures in Texas. That should be very interesting, so you may want to be here for that. Anyway, that's, that's all we have coming up that I know of. There's one more, but I won't go into that. Uh, our speaker tonight is Stephen Butler. He's a PhD historian and author. He's going to talk about why the Republican Party is bad, both for America and the world. He's going to talk about, he will discuss beginning with the late 19th century and coming forward to the present day. Dr. Dr. Butler will cite s several specific examples to illustrate how the Republican Party's abandonment of the liberal ideology of Abraham Lincoln in favor of conservatism has unnecessarily caused real and lasting harm not only to the United States but also to other nations around the globe. So without further ado, I wish to give a very huge warm welcome to Stephen Butler, our speaker tonight. Well, you didn't finish eating, but what was happening? Okay, good evening. I could have sworn we started speaking. I, I was going to speak at 7. <laughs> Took me by surprise. All right. Uh, you've looked at the uh, handout by now of 33 damning indictments. I actually started out, the first list I had was 21, and then uh, it was about a week or two ago, and then I started adding to it, and I kept coming up with things, and I finally realized I was going to have to stop somewhere. <clears throat> is going to run off the page. Um, I wish I had more than an hour because there's no way I can talk about all these things. So I'm just going to kind of rush through this and then if anybody has any questions about anything, maybe we can go into more depth. One of the things that I think a lot of people don't quite realize is that the two major political parties in the United States today, the Republican and the Democratic parties, were once ideologically the opposite of what they are today. The uh, Democrats used to be the conservative party and the Republicans were the liberal party uh, when they first got started back in the 1850s. In fact, I'm going to quote Theodore Roosevelt on that. In his autobiography, Theodore Roosevelt wrote, in the days of Abraham Lincoln, the Republican Party was founded as the radical, progressive party of the nation. And until the mid-1890s, or maybe a little earlier, it remained the nationalist as against the particularist, or states' rights party. But uh, in time, he wrote, the uh, various issues tended to throw the party into the hands not merely of the conservatives but of the reactionaries of men who sometimes for personal and improper reasons distrusted anything that was progressive also want to go back and uh, and uh, quote also from abraham lincoln himself since i've mentioned lincoln in 1854 the year the republican party was born as a consequence of the kansas nebraska act Abraham Lincoln wrote a letter in which he said this about what was the purpose of government. Somebody asked him, what, what do you think the purpose of government is? And he wrote, the, the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done, but cannot do it at all or cannot do so well for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. And therein, I think, you have the fundamental difference between uh, the conservative and liberal ideologies in this country. Uh, conservatives tend to uh, stress a, a sort of uh, individualistic, go it alone uh, way of thinking, and uh, Democrats tend to be more uh, inclined to want to work together. Uh, collectively to get things done. And in keeping with this, Lincoln and uh, the uh, Republicans who followed him in the Reconstruction era after his death, they did a lot of uh, great things. Abraham Lincoln is one of my 
favorite presidents. Because he ended slavery, the Republicans of that era also advocated equal rights for African Americans. We have the uh, radical Republicans of the 1860s to thank for the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Amendment. They gave free land to homesteaders. They provided government assistance to railroads and they also provided government assistance to higher education. And uh, these were all, I think, admirable uh, activities. But uh, by the end of the century, the Republican Party was not quite the same as it had been in Lincoln's time. Uh, in fact, uh, by, the, by 1890, the New York Times ran an article and the headline said, no longer the party of Lincoln. And uh, they quoted a, a fellow named Howard McSherry, who was a prominent Republican, who had just switched parties to the Democrats because he felt that the Republicans were, as he put it, no longer the party of Lincoln. And uh, there's a great cartoon that appeared on the cover of a magazine uh, back in this time period, around 1900. I have a picture of it here. I don't know if you can see it. It shows a baby elephant representing the GOP with a uh, Democratic donkey bearing down on him in a car. <laughs> and there are two hands reaching out to save the little GOP elephant. And one of the hands says, Stan Patter, and the other says, Insurgents. And this was the time period when Theodore Roosevelt was president that the Republican Party was undergoing some really fundamental changes in ideology. And Roosevelt was trying, to, Theodore Roosevelt was trying to bring the Republicans back to the old faith, as some people called it, the more liberal outlook. And the Stan Patters were trying to pull it towards the conservative uh, end of the political spectrum. And the, well, as it turns out, the Stan Patters won the day. Democrats, of course, have changed too. One of the most striking examples of this that I often point out to people is uh, I compare the two Johnsons. We've had two presidents named Johnson, Andrew Johnson and Lyndon Johnson. They have some things in common. They were both Democrats. They were both Southern Democrats. Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee. Lyndon Johnson, as I'm sure you know, was from Texas. They both became presidents as a result of a uh, assassination. In the case of Andrew Johnson, of course, it was the assassination of Lincoln. In the case of Lyndon Johnson, again, as I'm sure you all are aware, it was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So they do have those things in common, but their political ideologies are so different. Andrew Johnson, in 1866, vetoed the 1866 Civil Rights Bill, which later was turned into the 14th Amendment, which defines citizenship and says the state can't deny someone their rights uh, you know, under the Constitution. He vetoed that bill, and he vetoed just about everything else the radical Republicans passed back during his administration. They got so fed up with him, they tried to impeach him, and he, he kept his job by one vote. President Lyndon Johnson, by contrast, not only championed, uh, not only signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but he also championed its passion passage, and he also championed the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the 1968 Civil Rights Act. So that's just one example of how the Democrats have changed quite a bit since those days. I'd also like to point out that the Democrats have also in this century, and uh, sorry, the last century, I forget what century I'm in sometimes, uh, I spent a lot of my years in the 20th century, so sometimes I forget I'm in a different century. Anyway, um, in the 20th century, the Democrats have been uh, uh, responsible for all sorts of progressive measures like Social Security, which, by the way, is not just retirement pensions. It's also unemployment, disability, aid to dependent children, things like that. Of course, Medicaid and Medicare. Democrats have always traditionally been uh, in favor of uh, raising the minimum wage from time to time, uh, providing financial aid uh, for higher education, uh, 
treating people with disabilities correct, the uh, right, the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law by the first President Bush, but it was a Democrat who championed it in the first place. And we even have the internet. Uh, believe it or not, you know, Al Gore didn't invent the internet, but he did have something to do with it uh, coming into uh, the, the common use that it does have today. He was the one who sponsored a bill called the High Performance Computing and Intercommunications Act back in the early 1990s that in, ended up leading to the uh, internet becoming widespread. And of course, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure, what a difference that has made to everybody's lives. And I think mostly in a positive way, I think so anyway. Now I'd like to go through a list of some of these things that are on here and that you may not be aware of that the Republican Party has been responsible for. Uh, the first one is termed the theft of Hawaii. Has anybody here been to Hawaii by any chance? Okay. Well, it's a beautiful place. But you may not be aware that the Republican Party stole it for us. You see, in 1893, Hawaii was an independent kingdom, and there was a small minority of white men who lived there who were sort of like the old southern planters. They owned big chunks of land. They didn't have slaves, but they had low-paid Hawaiian and uh, Asian workers that they imported from various parts of Asia. They didn't like that the queen, Queen Lilio Kalani, wanted to uh, bring back a government that was more responsive to the majority of the people, the native Hawaiians, so they conspired with a with the ambassador from the United States, a man named John Stevens, who was a Republican, by the way, to uh, overthrow the queen. And uh, they used, illegally used, a U.S. military force, uh, Marines and sailors from the USS Boston at Pearl Harbor. After they overthrew the queen, this was a coup d'etat. This was not a popular uprising. In fact, most Hawaiians didn't even know it had taken place until they read about it in the newspapers the next day. The uh, president at the time of the United States was Benjamin Harrison, a Republican, and uh, the, uh, the uh, white planters there in Hawaii formed, very quickly formed a provisional, uh, a, uh, provisional government. They called it the Republic of Hawaii. And uh, Benjamin Harrison made a treaty with them to annex Hawaii to the United States. But he wasn't in office very long before Grover Cleveland took over. Cleveland smelled a rat. So he withdrew the treaty from the Senate and he sent an investigator out to Hawaii and the investigator discovered that the truth of the matter was that this was not a popular uprising. This was a coup d'etat that U.S. forces had been illegally used by the U.S. ambassador and uh, even uh, Congress had weighed in on this. Let me tell you what the president said first of all. President Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, said it appears that Hawaii was taken possession of by the United States forces without the consent or the wish of the government of the islands or anybody else so far as shown as, except the United States minister. And then Congress, 177 congressmen, mostly Democrats, passed a resolution condemning the takeover of Hawaii the Republican minority voted against the resolution. It is the sense of this House that the action of the United States Minister in employing the United States Naval Forces and illegally aiding and overthrowing the constitutional government of the Hawaiian Islands in January 1893, 1893 and in setting up in its place a provisional government not Republican in form and in opposition to the will of the majority of the people was contrary to the traditions of our Republic and the spirit of our Constitution and should and be, should be and is condemned. Well, um, Cleveland didn't go as far as he could have. He withdrew the treaty, kept it withdrawn, never took any more action on it because of what had happened, but he did not restore the monarchy. I uh, hate to say that he kind of, uh, he, did, he didn't go as far as he should have. And the reason he didn't was because he was, um, he said he didn't want uh, white men to, to, uh, to be hanged 
on his account. The Queen of Hawaii had made it pretty clear if she was restored to the throne, she would try the conspirators for treason, which uh, they had committed, and they would almost certainly hang. So McK uh, Cleveland didn't want them to hang, so he didn't go so far as to restore the Queen. And so the uh, Republic of Hawaii continued for another four years until William McKinley, a Republican, took office. He put the treaty back in the Senate, and when he did, Native Hawaiians sent letters of protest, uh, petitions. You can see these in the National Archives today, protesting against the impending annexation of Hawaii. The Hawaiian people did not wish to be annexed to the United States. It was very clear. And many senators, when they, you know, heard about all this, they started getting, you know, uh, concerned about it too. And, so I don't know if you know this, but it takes two-thirds of the senators to ratify a treaty, and McKinley couldn't get the two-thirds he needed. So he resorted instead to what's known as a joint resolution of Congress, which, by the way, is how Texas entered the Union, too, when John Tyler couldn't get two-thirds vote on a treaty. So McKinley fell back on the Texas uh, precedent, he asked both houses of Congress, in which there was a Republican majority, to pass a joint resolution of annexation of Hawaii. Let me tell you how the vote went. 209 members of the House of Representatives voted yes to annex. They were almost all, all but 18 were uh, Republicans. 91 voted against annexation. Only three of those were Republicans. The, the, uh, the majority were, of those who voted against annexation were Democrats. In the Senate, the vote was very similar, split right along party lines pretty much. Republicans for annexation, Democrats against. Why? Because the Hawaiian people did not want to be annexed to the United States. But McKinley didn't care about that, and so that's how we got Hawaii. Now there's an epilogue to this. In 18, sorry, 1993, when uh, Bill Clinton was in office, Congress passed a resolution apologizing to the Hawaiian people for the illegal takeover of their islands. And guess how the vote went? Mostly Democrats voting to apologize for what the Republicans did 100 years earlier and most of the Republicans not voting for the resolution. So that's Hawaii. Now, what about the Philippine-American War? You may not have ever even heard of this war. I never heard about it when I was in school, but uh, you've heard of the Spanish-American War. That lasted all of what, about two months uh, before the fighting was over? But you've probably never heard of the Philippine-American War, which lasted three years cost the lives of over 4,000 Americans, and cost, let's see, I wrote down the cost here, $400 million. Oh, and also the lives of 20,000 uh, Filipino independence fighters, and we don't know how many thousands of civilians. But here's what happened. We went to war against Spain in 1898. Uh, we helped liberate Cuba. That was a good thing. But when we made a treaty with Spain for $20 million, we bought the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico, sort of a package deal. Nobody asked the Filipinos anything about this. The Filipinos had actually declared their independence six months before this treaty, on June the 12th, 1898. Let me read you part of the Filipino Declaration of Independence. Under the protection of our powerful and humanitarian nation, the United States of America, we do hereby proclaim and solemnly declare in the name by authority of the people of these Philippine Islands that they are and have the right to be free and independent. They modeled their Declaration of Independence after ours. We helped the Filipinos, uh, sorry, the Filipinos helped us defeat the Spanish in the Philippines. In fact, when our troops arrived, by the time our troops arrived in the Philippines in August of 1898, the Spanish were almost completely beat. They were, uh, and they were willing to surrender. 
Uh, they said, but only to white men. They surrendered to the U.S. forces. They wouldn't surrender to the Filipinos. And uh, then in December, the treaty was made. The United States decided to buy the Philippines for $20 million. But once again, a treaty has to be ratified. So there were a lot of... Uh, a lot of people in the Senate who were concerned about this. Now let me tell you a little bit about President McKinley's attitude toward the Filipinos. He was concerned about this and here's what he said eventually on the subject. I walked the floor of the White House night after night until midnight and I'm not ashamed to tell you <clears throat> gentlemen that I went down on my knees and prayed Almighty God for light and guidance and one night it came to me there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and Christianize them and by God's grace do the best we could for them and the next morning I sent for the chief engineer of the War Department and told him to put the Philippine Islands on the map of the United States and there they are now I find this interesting that McKinley wanted to Christianize the Filipinos who had been under the rule of Roman Catholic Spain for 400 years <clears throat> there were only two there were only two Republican senators who opposed McKinley's attempt to keep the Philippines one of them was Senator George Hoare with an unfortunate last name spelled H-O-A-R here's what he said and remember this is at a time when the Republicans are undergoing this ideological switch I stand here today to plead with you to not to abandon the principles that have brought about the liberation of Cuba and the Philippines. I implore you to keep to the policy that has made the country great, that has made the Republican Party great. Especially if I could, would I persuade the great Republican Party to come back to its old faith. There is yet time. It is not yet too late. But the trouble was that there was still this strong sentiment among the Republicans to go ahead and take the Philippines, whether the Filipinos wanted them to or not. Well, the Filipino in, uh, re, Liberation Army was still in the field at the same time that there were U.S. troops in the uh, United States. The treaty was eventually ratified by just a couple of votes, and then fighting broke out in the Philippines between the Filipinos and the United States troops that were already there. And what followed was a three year long bloody war against Filipino guerrillas determined that the Philippines would remain independent. They had helped us overthrow the Spanish and they expected to become independent. And now the McKinley administration is saying, no, you're going to be part of the United States instead. Well, that was bad enough that we had betrayed these people, that we decided we were not going to let them determine their own destiny. But what made it worse is that our soldiers were very full of the sort of racism that was rampant at that time. Our soldiers committed all sorts of atrocities against the Filipinos. They used something that was called the water cure. Does that sound familiar? I've even got a slide here with a picture of a Filipino being subjected to the so-called water cure. Let me read you a letter. This was published in the newspaper. It's from a U.S. soldier uh, who wrote home. He says, The town of Tatadia was surrendered to us a few days ago in two companies. Uh, occupy the same. Last night one of our boys was found shot and his stomach cut open. Immediately orders were received from General Wheaton to burn the town and kill every native in sight. About 1,000 men, women, and children were reported killed. This is in retaliation for the death of one U.S. soldier. He writes further, I am probably growing hard-hearted for I am in my glory <clears throat> when I can sight my gun on some dark skin and pull the trigger. Let me advise you a little and should a call for volunteers be made for this place, do, do not be so patriotic as to come here. Tell all my inquiring friends that 
I'm doing everything I can for Old Glory and for the America I love so well. Senator Albert Beveridge, who was a Republican senator, had this to say when to the critics of McKinley's war in the Philippines. It has been charged that our conduct of the war has been cruel. We must remember we are not dealing with Americans or Europeans. We are dealing with Orientals. Anyway, I'm going to cut to the chase because I've got a lot of material to cover here and I don't know how I'm going to get through it. Most of the people who were against this war were people like uh, Samuel Gompers of the AFL, Andrew Carnegie, the writer Mark Twain, former President Grover Cleveland, Jane Adams of the whole house, William Jennings Bryan who had run for president in 1896 and would again in 1900. Andrew Carnegie offered the United States government $20 million. And he had plenty of money, believe me. He had, he had bundles of money. Wait, $20 million was chump change to, to Carnegie. He offered to buy the Philippines for $20 million from the American government just so he could give them their independence. Here's what Mark Twain said about it. He was very sarcastic. We have pacified some thousands of the islanders and buried them, destroyed their fields, burned their villages, and tortured their widows and orphans, furnished heartbreak by exile to some dozens of disagreeable patriots, subjugated the remaining 10 millions by benevolent assimilation, which is the pious new name of the musket, and so by these providences of God and the phrases the government's not mine, we are a world power. Despite all the people who spoke out against the uh, betrayal of the Philippine, Filipinos, uh, the McKinley administration went ahead and in 1902 they finally subdued the Philippine Islands. Like I said, at a cost of $400 million, over 4,000 Americans dead, 20,000 Filipino fighters dead. We don't know the civilian casualties. But I'll just conclude by saying that it was uh, it was the Democrats who finally gave the Filipinos their independence. FDR signed a bill in 1934 that paved the way for Filipino independence, and Harry Truman carried it out in 1946. Another thing that I want to talk about tonight that uh, I think the uh, Republicans have to answer for is their opposition to President Woodrow Wilson. President Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat. In 1919, after World War I, President Wilson went to Paris to help negotiate the Treaty of Paris, uh, tr sorry, the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. He had what he called his 14 points, you may recall. The 14th was the formation of a League of Nations to preserve world peace. He brought that treaty back to the United States, put it in the Senate, but unfortunately for Wilson, in the midterm elections, <clears throat> he found himself in a situation much like President Obama finds himself in today. He had a Senate with a Republican majority by the time the treaty was brought back to the United States. And the Republicans didn't like this idea of a League of Nations. The principal opponent was a Republican senator from Massachusetts named Henry Cabot Lodge who led the opposition and uh, eventually the treaty uh, just died in the Senate because the Republicans didn't want to have the League of Nations as Woodrow Wilson had envisioned it as part of the treaty. Now, what effect did that have on the future? Well, it's hard to know. The League of Nations lasted for 20 years and if the United States had been a part of it, and it's ironic that it was, a pre well, it was the idea of, a, of a, an American president. If the League of Nations had had the United States participating in it, you know, you can't help but wonder, would Hitler and Mussolini have been able to come to power in Europe the way they did? Would they have been able to get away with some of the things that they got away with before we finally got involved over there? It, you know, we'll never know because we weren't a part of the League of Nations. And why weren't we? Because of the Republicans. Now let's uh, move fast forward to the 1920s. When, am I, when, when is my cutoff time? Um, quarter to eight. Quarter to eight, okay. The 1920s. Throughout the 1920s, the Republicans controlled 
both all three branches of the government. We had three Republican presidents in a row, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover. The Republicans controlled both houses of Congress until 1931 uh, when the uh, Democrats uh, regained control of the House, but not the Senate. The judiciary was made up of mostly conservative justices that were had been uh, appointed by Republicans. And the Secretary of the Treasury at that time was a man named Andrew W. Mellon. And he was the architect of the Republican fiscal policy that was adopted by Harding and Coolidge and continued by Hoover. This, uh, this uh, plan, this fiscal policy was give big tax cuts to the investor class, give modest tax cuts to average Americans, and reduce the federal inheritance or estate tax. When Calvin Coolidge was president in 1924 and again in 1926, Coolidge approved tax cuts passed by a Republican-controlled Congress that gave, here's this, look at, listen to these cuts. This is the first one, 1924. For the wealthy, the tax cuts went from a 72% rate down to 46%. Then in 1926, it was cut down to 25%. People who earned less than $24,000 a year, which was the majority of Americans, got a 1% decrease in their taxes. The problem with this is that it fueled speculation in the stock market, which was completely unregulated. Stock prices went up through the roof. They were inflated, they were artificially inflated. Stock prices were higher than what the stocks were actually worth, but stocks were performing so well then there was a big demand for them. It's kind of like buying, uh, you know, a ticket to a concert or a sporting event. You, you know, you wait to the last minute and you buy from a scalper, you pay more. It's just kind of the way they were doing with the stocks. Some people, though, saw there was a problem with uh, this. Uh, there, there was widespread employment at the time. Businesses were booming throughout most of the 1920s. Um, but another thing that fueled the speculation was a lot, of, uh, a lot of businesses paid high dividends to investors. They also put a plowed a lot of their profits into expansion of production. The trouble is they didn't raise their workers' wages very much. Let me read you an article from a newspaper from this time period. The few, however rich, cannot purchase the products of a machine age. They can't. To consume the output of machinery, there must be millions who have money to spend. These millions are workers, producers. How can their purchasing power be increased? By paying them higher wages. They must be paid enough money to purchase the vast quantity of goods produced by machinery, else the machines must remain idle. In other words, every invention of a machine or method to increase production necessitates a corresponding increase in wages to provide purchasing power to absorb the increased output. My economic expert here, John Beasley, would probably agree with that. Anyway, I'm, I, I'm, I, I don't know how I'm going to cover all this, but to cut to the chase, you probably all know that the stock market crashed on what was called Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929. And a lot of this was due to the rampant speculation in stocks and also to the fact that uh, all these factories were producing uh, goods like there was no tomorrow, uh, only there was a tomorrow. And it was a tomorrow in which suddenly everybody who could afford to buy something had bought it. And uh, so, uh, sales started to decline and uh, that meant the stocks weren't worth as much as they used to be and of course people panicked and next thing you know uh, we've got a depression. There was a senator from uh, Arkansas, his name was uh, Robinson, who uh, I've got a newspaper article here, he says uh, he blames Coolidge, Hoover and Mellon for conditions leading to market collapse. President Hoover and other prophets and high priests of American prosperity were blamed tonight by Senator Robinson of Arkansas, the Democratic leader for the stock market plunge and for failure to take prompt steps to check it. Um, and he went on to say that uh, 
you know, that the Republicans basically were responsible for the, the great crash, which I agree with, they were. And what happened? The Great Depression. You may not know this, but in 1932, the, the worst year of the Depression, 25% of the American workforce was out of a job. And a lot of people were underemployed. Between 1930 and 33, over 9,000 U.S. banks failed. Depositors lost $2.5 billion in deposits. By the time Franklin Roosevelt came into office in March of 1933, the whole U.S. banking system was on the verge of collapse. Young people became hobos. Farmers, farm incomes declined by 60%. A third of all U.S. farmers lost their jobs. And Herbert Hoover said, well, let the charities take care of it. The problem is the charities had more demand and less income because of all of the people who were out of work. You know what Hoover actually said? This is Herbert Hoover, Republican. What the country needs is a good big laugh. There seems to be a condition of hysteria. If someone could get off a good joke every 10 days, I think our troubles would be over. That was Hoover's prescription for getting out of the Depression. We just laugh our way out of it. Anyway, uh, Hoover was completely against using the power of the federal government to help, the, uh, to give direct relief to people who had lost their homes, their jobs, their self-respect, uh, probably everything else that was dear to them. He did back the uh, Reconstruction Finance Bill, which gave, uh, was basically a bailout, um, but it was too little, too late. He did back some uh, public works projects such as the dam that's a name for him out in uh, Arizona, but that only employed a few thousand construction workers. And by the time, uh, you know, 1932 rolled around, people were using his name in vain, as I'm sure you've heard of the term Hooverville being uh, applied to, uh, uh, you know, shanty towns and Hoover blankets. That's a, that's a, um, a newspaper that you cover yourself with to stay warm when you're sleeping on a park bench. Hoover hogs, that's what we call roadkill that we eat because we haven't got anything else. And there's also the Hoover flag, I'll demonstrate that. Here's the Hoover flag. You can figure out what that means. Then in 1932, Herbert Hoover really shot himself in the foot. In 1932, thousands of World War I veterans came to Washington to demand immediate payment of a bonus that Congress had promised them uh, in 1945, about $1,000 per man. But they said, we need the money now. So they basically uh, camped out there in Washington. They set up a Hooverville and occupied government buildings and everything and asked if they could please have their money. Well, the House, which by this time was in the hands of the Democrats, said, sure, you can have your money, but the Republicans controlled the Senate, and they said, hell no. And Hoover said, okay, that's it. You guys get out of town. So he called in the Army, and using tear gas, tanks, and bayonets, World War I veterans, men who had risked their lives for their country in France in 1917-18, were run out of town, and a couple of them got killed in the process. Okay, I'm moving right along here. In 1939, World War II had started. You probably know this. Britain and France declared war on Germany after it invaded Poland. President Franklin Roosevelt, a Democrat, wanted to help Britain and France. But his uh, hands were tied by what were known as the Neutrality Acts. This, uh, this meant that uh, no U.S. business could sell things to the British or the French on, or any warring nation on credit. We couldn't loan any money to them either. So he convinced Congress to let them do what's known as cash and carry. They would send their ships over here, they'd pay cash for whatever they needed, and they'd take it back on their own ships. As you probably know, in spring of 1940, Hitler took over several countries in Europe, France, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, Netherlands, uh, it already invaded Poland, it already annexed Austria and, uh, and uh, Czechoslovakia prior to that. There was one country that stood up to him, Great Britain, 
from 1940, from, the, from June of 1940 until December of 1941, Great Britain was the only country that was standing alone against Britain. The British people were pounded by the Luftwaffe. They were bombed in the Blitz. They had what was known as, what's that? The Soviets uh, were, uh, they had a treaty with Hitler at the time. But eventually, when Hitler couldn't uh, do much with the, with the British, he finally gave up and, 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 and went to war against the Soviets. But, any case, but in any case, my point here is that Britain was holding out all by itself, and FDR wanted to help Churchill and the British people, but what could he do? In December of 1940, he made a speech in which he said the United States should be an arsenal democracy. And to get around those uh, pesky neutrality acts again, he asked Congress to pass a bill called Lend-Lease. He said, here's what we'll do. Britain is holding out. Britain is bankrupt. And they're holding out against Hitler. If we don't help them, we're next. So we've got to help them. So if we can't give them stuff on credit, we can't loan them money, let's loan them the armaments they need. Let's loan them the food they need. Let's loan them the ships they need. Let's loan them everything they need to hold off Nazi tyranny. Let's do that or lease it to them. And then, you know, they can pay us something for it later on. Well, you might find this interesting. In the House, the vote on Lend-Lease went as follows. 236 Democrats and 24 Republicans voted for the bill. Voting against it were 135 Republicans. 25 Democrats, one Labor and uh, three Progressives and one Farmer Labor. So in other words, it was largely Republicans who didn't want to help Great Britain in their hour of need. And as a person who's married to someone who's British, I'm very offended by that. Now let's fast forward to 1945. The war is over. President Harry Truman, unlike Franklin Roosevelt, didn't have to worry about dealing with the Depression and World War II. I mean, you know, Truman wrapped it up there at the end, as you know. And then he was president for nearly eight years. In 1945 and again in 1949, President Truman proposed a bill that he wanted Congress to pass, a, per, a comprehensive health program bill. It called for several things. It called for more uh, government uh, spending on hospitals, on doctor education, and it also called for national health insurance for all Americans. In other words, all Americans would have a national health insurance policy where they could all have access to health care regardless of income, age, infirmity, anything. In other words, we would, he wanted to expand Social Security to include uh, health. Well, I don't think I have to tell you who was against it. And here's what President Truman said about his national health insurance plan, which of course was defeated by the Republicans. I have never been able to understand all the fuss some people make about government wanting to do something to improve and protect the health of the people. I usually find that those who are loudest in protesting against medical help by the federal government are those who do not need help. But the fact is that a large portion of our population cannot afford to pay for proper medical treatment. I caution the Congress against being frightened away from health insurance by the word socialized medicine, which some people were bandying about. I wanted no part of socialized medicine, and I knew the American people did not. Under socialized medicine, all doctors would work as employees of the government. I was proposing no such system. Our belief in insurance against unnecessary loss had become an American tradition. And what I offered was a workable plan for insurance against loss of one of our most priceless possessions, health. Okay. I'm skipping a few of these, obviously, because I don't have time to go all over them. So I'm going to jump ahead to the 1980s and talk a little bit about Ronald Reagan, the darling of the Republican Party. Myth versus reality. Ronald Reagan, uh, if you talk to people uh, on the, on the, in the GOP, they seem to think he's some sort of demigod. Um, 
He's mythologized as the president who cut taxes, reduced federal spending, and the size of the federal government. But unfortunately, that belief does not square with reality. Between 1982 and 1988, Reagan signed Alex 11 tax increases. Under Reagan, the federal budget deficit and federal debt both substantially increased, and under Reagan, the size of the federal government actually also increased. And in contrast to cuts in social spending, Reagan asked for increased defense spending. By the time he left office, defense spending was 43% higher than it was at the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, there's all sorts of other things I could say, but again, I'm going to run out of time here, so I just thought I'd mention that Ronald Reagan is not what a lot of people think he was. Fast forward to 1993, the Clinton health care plan. Well, those of you around know what happened to that one, too, and who did it. The Clintons also wanted to propose a national health insurance for, a, for the American people. The Republicans shot it down, that one down, too. Speaking of Clinton, now, Bill Clinton, on a personal level, disappointed me, as I'm sure he did a lot of us. But I really don't think it was worth the government spending $40 million on a fruitless effort to connect him and First Lady Hillary Clinton to an Arkansas financial scandal. $40 million, or is it $400? I, I may have left out a zero there. Yeah, I think it's $400 million. And eventually, Ken Starr, you may recall, who investigated Clintons for five years, spent all that money, wasted all that money, finally found a personal flaw in Clinton's character that, he, that the Republicans went after, just to get rid of the guy. Now, I think what Bill Clinton did, in terms of his personal life, was reprehensible. But... It didn't have any effect, as far as I could see, on his governance of the country. But the Republicans seemed to think so, and they tried. They wasted, again, a lot of time and effort trying to get him out of office. And, uh, well, we know how that turned out. Then there was this guy named Phil Graham. Maybe you've heard of him. Senator Phil Graham in 1999. He uh, was one of the sponsors of the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act which undid key provisions of the uh, WAC, oh, sorry, Glass-Steagall Act of 1934 that separated uh, ordinary banking from high-risk banking. We can thank Mr. Graham, uh, at least in part, for the financial meltdown of the early 2000s. I'm going to bring up global warming again like I did last time. I'm a believer in that. And the United States, under Republican administrations, haven't done much about that. And I'm going to save the last 15 minutes for my favorite, W. <laughs> I keep hoping I'll, I keep hoping I'll, you know, run into him somewhere in some public place so I can give him, give him a little piece of my mind. Now, this is something I find interesting. When Bush and Gore were debating one another on television in 2000, one of the questions that was asked, I think it was in the second uh, uh, on, uh, uh, tele televised debate, somebody asked, uh, yeah, it was Jim Lehrer. I got a picture of him here. Jim Lehrer asked him, said, uh, you know, the government is running a, a surplus right now. What would you do with that surplus? It was then... Uh, budget surplus, $128 billion annually. The federal government was taking in, excuse me, $128 billion more uh, than, uh, than it was spending. And uh, they asked, he asked Bush and Gore, what would, the, what would you do with this? And Gore said, well, I'd use the money to pay down the national debt, which was then about 5.7, almost $6 trillion. And that was largely because of Ronald Reagan and the first Bush. Well, we know what George W. said he'd do with it. I'll give everybody a tax cut. Send them all a check for $200 or whatever it was. The Bush tax cuts 
totaling $2.48 trillion from 2000 to 2010 gave the most relief to wealthy Americans. Cuts were favored mostly by Republicans. Democrats argued that the burden of taxation was being shifted to the middle class. Tax rates on incomes over $307,000 were lowered from 39% to 35%. The estate or death tax, as some people like to call it, exclusion increased yeah, increased from 1 million to 3.5 million with repeal to take effect in 2010. And critics have pointed out that the tax cuts which were meant to stimulate the economy failed to do so. Ironically, the economy was stronger during the Clinton years when taxes were higher. And the cuts, of course, also helped create the large national debt that now exists. Something else that I uh, find uh, interesting about Mr. Bush is that 9-11, uh, the 9-11 uh, Commission, uh, the Bush administration was against the, uh, uh, initially opposed the formation of the 9-11 Commission. Uh, it took, uh, it wasn't completed until 2004. The Warren Commission was completed within less than a year after the Kennedy assassination. Uh, it, it, took, it took until 2004 to get a 9-11 Commission report. Less money, $15 million, uh, was spent, less money was spent investigating 9-11 than had been spent investigating President Clinton's alleged Whitewater connections. Isn't that interesting? $15 million up as versus $40 million. Also, uh, the report, the 9-11 report, let's talk about that for a minute. It revealed that while President Bush was vacationing at his ranch in Crawford, Texas in August 2001, he received a presidential briefing entitled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S. And when questioned about the memo by the 9-11 Commission, Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor at the time, said, it wasn't something we felt we needed to do anything about. Here's another thing about the 9-11 Commission. Although Bill Clinton's sworn testimony about Monica Lewinsky was videotaped, neither President Bush nor Vice President Cheney were required to take an oath prior to answering commission questions about 9-11. They were also questioned together instead of separately, and no official record was made of their testimony. Then there's the Iraq War. Prior to 9-11, few key figures in the Bush administration seemed to view Saddam Hussein as a threat. Here's what Colin Powell said in February 2001. He has not developed any significant capabilities with respects to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. Condoleezza Rice said in July 2001, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. But then, after 9-11, things changed. Although none of the 9-11 attackers were Iraqis, in January 2002, President Bush and other members of his administration began making a case for war with Iraq. Between 9-11 and March 2, 2003, President Bush and members of his administration made 935 assertions that Iraqi President Saddam Hussein posed an imminent threat to the United States. Many of these statements suggested a link between Iraq and the 9-11 attacks. Throughout 2002 and 2003, the president repeatedly said that Saddam Hussein's Iraq was a threat while at the same time evoking the trauma of 9-11. At the same time, he rarely spoke of the war in Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden. I can't, don't have time to read all the quotes, but I think it's interesting that Vice President Dick Cheney said he knew exactly where those weapons were hidden. <laughs> anyway, eventually, eventually, um, you know, you all know the, the, what happened. In November 2002, Bush convinced Congress to pass the Iraq War Resolution. Um, now, the Afghanistan war resolution, by, this, by the way, was nearly unanimous. But in the one for Iraq, the vote 
the House vote was 296 to 133. The Senate vote was 77 to 23. Almost all the nay votes were Democrats, including uh, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts. And although he wasn't in the, uh, the he was in the Illinois Senate at the time, a fellow named Barack Obama said this, uh, Saddam Hussein poses no imminent direct threat to the United States. The Iraqi economy is in shambles. The Iraq military a fraction of its former uh, self. So Bush goes to the United Nations. And what does the United Nations do? They say, well, we're going to give them another chance to, you know, assure us they don't have any WMD. You may remember a guy named Hans Blix. He went there with a team between November 2002, March 2003, came back and said, there's nothing there. So what happens? Finally, Colin Powell caves. He goes to the UN and he holds up vials that are supposed to be representative, you know, scary stuff, talks about mushroom clouds and all that. And of course, in uh, 2003, the United States unilaterally went to war in Iraq. And to uh, cut to the chase, to date, no weapons of mass destruction have ever been found in Iraq. And I want to go on record as saying I never believed there were any there in the first place. I remember watching the invasion on television and I said to my family, if they find any weapons, I'll eat my hat. Well, my hat is still intact. Of course, there's also the sweetheart deals for Halliburton Corporation. No bid contracts for the company the vice president was connected with. As of 2009, the U.S. had about 115,000 troops in Iraq. By the time the war ended in December 2011, 4,484 had died. That's about uh, uh, twice the number that were killed in the 9-11 attacks, which had nothing to do with Iraq. 33,000 men had been seriously wounded mostly by IEDs and the financial cost of the war has been estimated at between three and four trillion dollars. Some members of the administration have regretted what happened. Colin Powell recanted in 2005. Former counterterrorism expert Richard Clark has done it. The Bush press secretary Scott McClellan War should be waged only when necessary, and the Iraq war was not necessary. Well, I don't have to tell you how what happened to the economy in 2007 and 2008. It went into the tank, as you know, largely because of all the uh, financial shenanigans that the Republicans had allowed to happen, just like they did in the 1920s. The national debt soared. I know it's it's gone up a lot since then, but I just want to give you some idea here. Al Gore said he would pay down the debt. He didn't get that chance. The national debt was nearly six trillion dollars when George Bush took office. By the time he left office, it was nearly eleven trillion. So he paid for two wars and uh, didn't cut any spending. And there's another thing about George Bush that I find personally reprehensible. And uh, this is why I put on my list here Republican traits. I included one of the Republican traits, hypocrisy. George W. Bush, you probably know, was old enough to have served in Vietnam, but he didn't. Okay, well, I'll, I want to go on record here saying uh, I was against the war in Vietnam. Uh, I did serve in the military during, during that time period. Um, I was in the United States Navy. I didn't happen to go to Vietnam, fortunately, but uh, I stepped forward and enlisted. George W. Bush entered the Air National Guard, and if those of you who were around back then knew, know this, that in order to stay out of Vietnam, but yet not 
have to take the step of resisting the draft and you know being sent to federal penitentiary, you could find a way out of it. You could join the reserves or the National Guard, the Air National Guard, because those guys weren't going to Nam. Not pretty sure George Bush knew that. So he joined the Air National Guard. He didn't go to Vietnam. And this is why I am upset with Mr. Bush, because then here it is in 2003, he didn't have any qualms about sending other people's boys to war. A war that was completely, utterly unnecessary, has cost us trillions of dollars, cost us more lives than we lost in 9-11, has left hundreds, tens of thousands of young men maimed. I see these guys on television, sometimes I see them in, in uh, real life. You know, half their heads been blown away, they got these scars. Are there missing limbs? Sometimes more than one limb? And this man has just really screwed up a lot of people's lives in a huge way. And so, like I say, if I ever get a chance to meet him personally, I put out my hand and take a hike. And let me tell you what else I have to say about you. Anyway, I'm just about up to my limit here. I've got a whole list of things here that I, it would take me probably five or six hours to cover in, 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 uh, in depth. But these are some of the reasons why I think Republicans on general are selfish, hip hypocritical, bigoted, completely lacking, or almost completely lacking in social responsibility, unwilling to work with other people, irrational thinking, poor decision making, unwillingness or inability to accept evidence. There may be some exceptions. There's always exceptions to some rules. And no, do or no respect for the doctrine of separation of church and state. I, just have not said as much as I would like to say, but I think you get the general idea that, and the reason I was uh, uh, inspired to, to come here tonight and do this is because of what happened in the recent uh, elections. I couldn't believe it. People are complaining that nothing is happening in Washington, that we've got gridlock. So what do they do? They give the Republicans control of both houses. Okay, did they really think that was going to work? If you want something to happen in Washington, you make sure that the president and the party in power in Congress are the same party, not different parties. If you want gridlock, then do it the way that we did it. And actually, I shouldn't say that the American people did it because I think uh, about 75% of the American people stayed at home and didn't even vote, which is pretty pathetic, I think. So, anyway, there you go. That's it. I've reached my limit. Thank you very much. I forgot. I forgot. Tom. Steve. Cheney has just admitted that he knew all about and condoned torture. Okay? Now, the United States is signatory to the International Convention on Torture. He knowingly violated that. He actually broke the law. What do you think should happen to such an individual? I say indict him. Do you, do you think he's a war criminal as well? Absolutely. Yes, they should do you, do you think he was, he was the real president during Bush's reign? I tended to think so at the time, yes, and I still kind of feel that way, yes. Yeah, I think Bush was, uh, was, uh, was the puppet and Cheney was the puppet master. That's, that's the way it appeared to me anyway. Okay. Um, in the front part here, it says, um, it talks about how the Republican Party abandoned the liberal ideology of Abraham Lincoln in favor of conservatism. And I just wanted to ask you, what gave you the impression that Abraham Lincoln held liberal ideology? Were you here about an hour ago? Well, I understand that, but, um, <laughs> which, what part of his ideals do you consider liberal in ideology? The fact that he was willing to use the power of the federal government to uh, do great things for the American people. Within the limits of the Constitution. Well, yes, of course. Right. But
but the fact of the matter is the Republicans, uh, like I say, they gave free land to homesteaders. Mm -hmm. They uh, subsidized the, uh, by, with land grants the growth of the railroads. They uh, set up uh, land grant colleges in the West. Lincoln, of course, and the Republicans freed the slaves, advanced civil rights. Uh, conservatives have traditionally been against those sorts of things. Uh, they don't want to spend the money or... Uh, I just meant specifically of Lincoln, his ideology specifically. Well, I mean, the, I, I was quoted, it the abolition I, of slavery? I quoted Lincoln. I said that Lincoln held that the purpose of government was to do for the people what they couldn't do for themselves or do so well. And that is, in my view, a liberal ideology that you get together and you do great things. You know, the United States has done some great things when we work together as a people. We built the Panama Canal. We defeated Hitler and Mussolini. You know, people talk about the government can't do anything. Well, the government put a man on the moon. In fact, put 12 men on the moon. You know, the government does a lot of good things uh, that people don't give the government credit for. And uh, it always gets me when uh, conservatives say, oh, the government can't do anything. Well, I'm, I have to deal with private insurance all the time. And uh, health insurance, that is. Uh, mostly for my wife, not so much for myself. And I can tell you the private sector uh, ain't so great either. Right. <clears throat> yeah, uh, bearing on that, I mean, have, have you ever read the, about the Gettysburg Address where, where Abraham Lincoln said that the government should, should be the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now that hasn't happened in donkey's years. Now that is, that is, now that saying government should, should step in and actually help the people, okay? Now, recently, you had Citibank in this, um, in, in this resolution, the continuing resolution for funding, stepping in and writing a law to permit these crooked banks on Wall Street to go ahead with this derivative scandal that actually was the cause. Now, as um, Elizabeth Warren said, who, what's the government for? Is it for the people or is it for the kleptomaniacs in Citibank and the like? Well, that's, you know, that's the, that's, that is the truth. Now, you know, if you, if you like the banks running everything, stealing everything, and promoting the casino in Wall Street, good luck. But this country is in dire trouble, dire trouble. My question is, is, is that a great thing, you know? But, you know, that is, that is Republican policy, actually. To, 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 yeah. Okay, well. I, I, I can't add to that. I, I agree with you. So. We have another one. Oh, one back there. I enjoyed your presentation, and uh, I don't find much to disagree with. And I'm not. I'm going to get to the question. Uh, what are the differences and similarities of what happened in 1929 in the United States and what happened in 2007 and 8 in the United States? Well, I think uh, there. You know, I'm not. You probably get a better, uh, more lucid answer from John. He's the economic expert. I'm not very all strong in economics. But I see that what happened is that when you, uh, when, when, you let, when you let bankers, especially investment bankers, financial people, uh, you give them a free reign, you don't exercise much oversight, they get up to all sorts of mischief. And the people end up suffering as a result. And so that, in my view, is what happened in the 1920s. Uh, we had a similar thing happen in, in, in the first decade of this century, but with one difference. It wasn't as bad, thank goodness, because of the safeguards that were put in place by the Democrats in the 1930s, by Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. You know, we didn't have, you know, when the, when the Depression occurred in 1929, 30, 31, there was no FDIC, there was no unemployment insurance, uh, there were no, there was no social security. There was nothing. There was no protect, no, no safety net at all. So people lost their life savings. They lost their homes. And uh, today we at least have some, some safety nets. Thank goodness. So it wasn't as deep. 
but the root uh, the root general cause is the same. You let you let people who control money or you know or handle a lot of money, you let them loose and you don't keep an eye on them, and they'll screw you every time. <laughs> Okay, uh, were you aware that there were two uh, significant congressional votes uh, to go into the war of Iraq? There were two big votes. One of them, the Democrats said no, and they turned it down. There was a big populist movement, there, the wave was going toward do something about Saddam Hussein and the threat. Uh, then there was another vote the Democrats wanted on board. They did not want to be left behind with a no vote. They did a second vote and they voted for the war in Iraq. Well, you heard the, uh, the uh, vote count I gave you. That was on the second vote. That, yes, there were some Democrats who voted for the war in Iraq. That is true. And I'm very ashamed that they did. I've never forgiven Hillary Clinton for that. Ted Kennedy didn't, and there were a lot of other Democrats who didn't either. The fact of the matter is, though, that the Bush administration deliberately made a case for the war. They went out and they, and they, and they, they, they took, the American people let themselves be uh, bamboozled, basically. They let themselves be fooled because the American people trusted the government. <laughs> it's funny how they, you know, uh, you talk about people who don't trust the government. Well, here's a good example. Of, uh, it's not so much the government, it's who's in, who's in the government at the time. George W. Bush and his administration just flat out lied to the American people. Or exaggerated. They exaggerated the threat. Saddam Hussein had never threatened to, to, uh, to attack us. He lacked the capability to attack us. And he did not pose a national security threat in the United States government, but the Bush administration convinced the American people that he was a threat, and that's why there was its populist movement to go to war with Iraq, because Bush conf conflated 9-11 with Iraq, which were two entirely different things, and the Iraqis had nothing to do with it. So it was a matter of people being sold a bill of goods, basically. Um, I just have one last question for you. Okay. Okay, so um, the 1964 Civil Rights Movement, you know, was a big movement for the black community. Right. And um, this is around the time when the parties had began to switch, you know. Um, That's true. Yeah. Um, John F. Kennedy, you know, one of the biggest liberal ideo <laughs> ideological um, figures, had, you know, was president. Right. Or, or, or he had just died. He, he had just died. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he died right after he put that bill yeah. in uh, Congress. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, and this is around the time when um, Ronald Reagan switched parties. You know, there was a whole mm -hmm. big switch. That's true. Um, in the civil rights movement, there was the vote in the House where 80% of Republicans voted yes and 63% of Republicans voted, I mean, of Democrats voted no. In the Senate, 82% of Republicans voted yes. 69% of Democrats voted yes. So basically, if the House had been all Democrat, only 63% would have voted for it, and it would actually have never been passed. What do you think about that? Where did you get these figures? Um, they're all open online. You can just look at No, no, where did votes. you get them just now? Oh, you can, did you bring, did you come prepared? Oh, I, while you were um, talking about it, I looked, I went. That's, I, a, that, you went and looked them up? Yeah. That's a little unfair because I don't have a smartphone. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, in answer to your question, uh, in, in the civil rights, a lot of the Democrats who voted against the civil rights bill were conservative Southern Democrats. And m many of those people switched parties later on, became Republicans. But this was after the transition, like you just stated. Well, well, well. <laughs> Regardless of the cause, it was still after the transition. No, I'm not excusing them. What I'm saying is that a lot of the Democrats who voted against civil rights in the 60s later changed over. They were Democrats. They were, they were labeled Democrats. They were, ideologically they were ideologically conservative. They were Democrats. They were Democrats, but they were ideologically conservative. And they later, when their party became the champion of civil rights under Lyndon Johnson, they changed parties. Strom Thurmond is a good example. 
You all know who Strom, Strom Thurmond is. In 1948, Strom Thurmond was a Southern Democrat. He was the governor of, of South Carolina. When Harry Truman, when Harry Truman was president and championed civil rights in 1948, Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats, as they were called, ran uh, a separate party, a segregationist uh, party. And uh, later on, Strom Thurmond actually uh, tried to filibuster the 64 Civil Rights Bill. He, yes, he, that's true, he was a Democrat. But I'm talking about ideologies here. Those people, those Democrats who were ideologically opposed to the liberal ideology, later became Republicans. And I think that's to the shame of the Republican Party that they accepted those people into their party. That was part of Nixon's Southern strategy. Oh, let's get all these disaffected Democrats. Let's get all these disaffected Democrats and, and round them up. And Strom Thurmond spent the rest of his career in the Senate, which was very long, as you know, as, as a Republican. Um, I just had um, one, well, are we about to get up? Is, will I have an opportunity to get up and talk, or can I just do that from here? Whatever. What's the difference between the Democrats and Republicans today? I think it's the same. The, the Democrats are still the Liberal Party, and the Republicans are still the Conservative Party. What's that? I I couldn't tell you. I'd have to look it up. You don't think so? No. I. It's approximately the same for each party. Approximately. What do you mean? For, so the percentage of Americans who voted in the recent elections. Oh, oh, I see. Approximately the same percent. So about 33% for each party. The, Ameri the American people are divided. Yeah, about it. No, I mean, how, what percentage of Democrats are. Would you say are ideologically liberal? Yes. So, well, that's a, you know, that's a, how liberal do you mean? I mean, there's different degrees of liberalism. Progressive. 30%, 40%. I'd like to believe it's over 50%. I don't think so. Well. You mentioned that the Republicans passed a bill that took down the separation between investment banking and ordinary banking. What president signed that bill? Oh, I know which president signed it, and I know you do too, Bill Clinton. And I'm ashamed this, of Bill for doing that. This goes back to the question. Yeah, I was. You, you quoted. But he public. didn't. Uh, but he didn't propose it. It was no. He didn't have to you went, no, that's true. You quoted a Republican senator, senator <coughs> near the turn of the century, said it is not too late to go back to the principles of Lincoln. Yeah. Today the Democrats say it is not too late to go back to the principles of Roosevelt. And it looks like it's headed the same way. Well, can I just make a one comment because I think this uh, ties in with what you all are saying here. I'm not saying that the Democrats are completely blameless of any, uh, thing, any anything that can be criticized. Okay. I'm just saying that if you take things on balance, the Democrats have done a lot more good for this country than the Republicans have, and the Republicans on balance have done a lot more harm than good. I'm not saying they haven't done anything good. There's a few things. I have to stop and think about it hard, but, but, but I'm talking about on balance. Nobody is completely 100% one thing or the other, okay? But, so that's what I'm saying. On balance, Republicans have a lot more to answer for than the Democrats. I think we're running out of questions. Okay. So you get to sit down, <clears throat> and uh, we get to hey, these other people here get a chance to get up here. Good job. Now it's your turn to talk. Uh, you got five minutes up here if you want to respond to what the speaker has to say. You want you want to be first? Go ahead. You got five minutes. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Josh. I'm, a, I'm his grandson. <laughs> I'm a college student currently studying political science. <laughs> well, <laughs> college student. 
<laughs> political science, I mean. Um, <laughs> um, first, I would like to oppose the notion that Lincoln held complete liberal ideology, and here's why. So first, I would like to start by saying that there were 39 framers of the United States Constitution. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty obvious. Um, there were 23 that voted on the prevention of slavery. 21 of the 23 original framers who voted, voted to prevent the spread of slavery. Well, it wasn't put in the Constitution, it was clear, because there was no way they would have formed the nation that we have today together. Um, it was clear that they wanted to prevent the split, spread of slavery. Um, Lincoln, during the war, um, decided that it was within his constitutional power under wartime to free the slaves. That was a big, very important part of our history. But this wasn't a progressive ideal. This was one of the founding conservative ideals. I mean, while both parties, I think today, do <laughs> all agree that, uh, I'm not meaning to say that by any means the liberals are um, for slavery. I don't mean that by any means. But what I am trying to say is that it was not a completely progressive ideal for Abraham Lincoln to free the slaves that made him a liberal, that made him have liberal ideology. He said this, don't interfere with anything in the Constitution that must be maintained, for it is the only safeguard of our liberties. Well, he may not have supported the liberal um, ideologies, I think that um, he wouldn't have supported putting it in the Constitution either. While it is a very strong point that slavery was to be freed, he wanted the our nation to be brought together so we could free slavery as one nation. And then when he was assassinated, you can see that the effects that it had. You know, the nation was torn apart and the black community was fractured for, I mean, even today it seems the effects have lasted until today. Um, I would like to take a second to address um, kind of I'd like to take a second to address the Republican traits. Um, I just felt like you know, might as well. Um, first one <laughs> is selfishness. I mean, okay, yeah, selfishness. Yeah, I can see it. But um, according to a study from Indiana University and MIT, conservatives tend to give more of their income towards the poor than liberals by nearly two thirds. You can look up the study online. Um, the second is hypocrisy. You know, we could talk of this hypocrisy of conservatives all day. We could probably talk of hypocrisy of every political party all day, but the truth is, is that, you know, we have a party that claims to stand for the American people, the Democratic Party, but yet they oppose constitutional rights like gun rights or anti-constitutional ideals. I think that when we have veterans who have fought and died for their, you know, for the American rights from the Constitution, and then you want to go out and openly oppose the very constitutional ideals by which this country is found and the greatness of our country, everything that is uniquely American, the things that you know I'm passionate about and you're passionate about, I think we need to stand by all of those things, whether it's as simple as saying, okay, how can we reduce the violence rather than sacrificing our freedoms? Um, bigotry, um, of course there are intolerant people, that, there's no question about that. But I think to call all Republicans intolerant, I think that's a little far-fetched. Um, to be tolerant but reject an ideology is what the Republicans stand for. Just because a lot of Republicans hold a certain ideology, whether it's against gay marriage or whatever it may be, I may not hold all of those ideals myself, um, but whether it's because they reject those, I don't think that's considered intolerant. Um, lack of social responsibility and unwillingness to work with others. Okay. Well, okay. So, we say, okay, well, Reagan signed an amnesty bill during his term. If that's not working with the other party, I don't know what is. Bush created government programs that, I mean, he, he's a Republican and he's, you know, he stands for a limited government, yet he would create government programs. If that's not a compromise for, so, for our national security, I don't know what is. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, the lack of social responsibility, this is a big one. Um, because, you know, Republicans aren't always all against government programs, but you see the, the bills that they put into signature, government programs that are based on personal responsibility, saying, okay, we can't shove government money into these programs. 
that we need to, it's more about the structure of the programs themselves than the money you put into it. And I know this from personal experience. <laughs> um, irrational thinking and poor decision making. Um, I'm sorry, I can't even read my own handwriting. Oh, this pen is awful. <laughs> um, I'll just move on. Um, no respect. Okay, huh? How about my five minutes? Oh, really? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, then I'll just finish with this quote um, about ideology. Um, centralized government has good intentions and does intend to benefit people. I don't doubt that. You know, that's part of our constitutional rights. But to sacrifice our freedoms in lieu of the centralized government and to learn from history and realize that centralized government ultimately has a negative outcome in the long run, I think that's one of the most important things we have to consider of political ideology. So thank you. Okay, who's next? Who wants to come on up here? Oh, you want to be next? Come on. <laughs> okay, um, where do you start? LBJ fought two wars at one time, the war in Vietnam and the war on poverty. No end of resources, human beings, and money, and lives were thrown into both of those. We lost the war in Vietnam, and we have lost the war on poverty. Poverty today is probably worse than it was during LBJ's time. It was as though he floundered, had no idea what to do, just throw money and resources at it. Some of our biggest, first of all, I should say, LBJ was a Democrat. Some of our greatest and most wonderful cities have been run by Democrats, and they are in utter ruin. Detroit is one of the most recent ones. They are bulldozing part of the city. Coleman Young was the mayor of Detroit for, check it out, almost 20 years. He devastated and ruined the city, drove out businesses. Philadelphia, run by Democrats. Coleman Young was a Democrat. New Orleans, Baltimore, you name the big cities, when they are devastated, they have poverty, they have ghettos, they have high crime, they've been run by Democrats. Obamacare is ruining the country. It is driving up unemployment. It is hurting people. And the full effect of it has not been completely felt yet. It is hurting health care. It is ruining some of the best health care in the world and it is driving up the cost of it. Jonathan Gruber, who was the one that had to testify before Congress, he said that Obamacare, the words have to be tortured in order to get this through. He said we've got to do this because of the stupidity of the American people. This is Jonathan Gruber, MIT professor. He is a Democrat. Obama is a Democrat. Obama is on track and for these next two years. He will have created more national debt than all of the presidents in our past. He's the, Stevens already talked about how Bush did increase the debt. We were outraged that he was just not even concerned about debt. We're sorry about that. That is bad. Bush was a Republican, but he was not conservative either. But the debt went sky high. He almost doubled it himself. And now then, you put all the debt together. What are we, 17 trillion or so? 16, 17 trillion. Uh, if it's uh, anywhere near uh, 20 trillion when Obama leaves, uh, that will more than double. That will be as much debt as uh, presidents have all accumulated in the past. All presidents. Obama, of course, is a Democrat. Reagan? Yes, the, the cost, the runaway uh, spending, 
Reagan was a Republican. We still love him. We still treasure him. But he had a Democrat Congress. And they betrayed him. They spent whatever they wanted. He got the tax cuts. Whose money was that? Whose money was that? Did it belong to government or did it belong to people who earned it? And he gave us tax cuts. Whatever rises this we're talking about, he gave the country tax cuts. And the country flourished for two solid decades and it flourished under Bill Clinton and he was glad to take credit for it. Whatever money was spent on bringing down Bill Clinton, the womanizer, was worth every dime. Thank you. <clears throat> it's always interesting to, to listen to Ray. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joy, actually. Um, um, us, uh, us Europeans, uh, we, we look at politics in America and we really don't see a progressive party. We do not, we do not see a party that's really for the average American uh, pe people at all. We see two fairly right-wing parties. One is a little bit more moderate than the other, but really both promote the interests of what I, what I would call perverted capitalism. Now, I've surprised Ray here before by saying that I'd like to see us return to capitalism. That I'd like to see us Re return to uh, not the cartel driven situation we have now. Uh, I've just heard Ray people discuss the deficit. Well, Ted Cruz, it's not the damn federal deficits that's the problem, it's the trade deficit. That has, is a symptomatic of, uh, of the destruction of the American manufacturing base. And it was, it was the delight. Of, of the kleptomaniacs that run corporate America to, sh to destroy trade unions because they didn't like trade unions having any power or say in government whatsoever. Now in Germany, where you have trade unions actually working with top management in, in corporations, so they run, the, run these businesses together. Now Germany is a powerhouse <laughs> industrial base still. It's not shipped its manufacturing base overseas. Okay, and it's still and it has a huge trade surplus. Now, what happens when you have this huge trade deficit is what I see in my own country, England. I mean, we are busily selling off. We ever since Thatcher and Reagan, both Britain and America has run a trade deficit from about the mid '80s. Okay, and concomitant with that was the loss was the loss of good work paid. American jobs and British jobs. And the people, the corporate power people in charge loved it. Now as we know, as we've discussed here, it's this corporate money that's bought democracy. They, they bought both parties. And so you, you, you see these wonderful trade pacts. I mean the colossal transfer of wealth to China is astounding. Now, now as I understand it, China is still a communist country. And yet America thought it was great to, to, to hand over all this technology and wealth and production. Now to me, I think it's asinine. Asinine. And they've betrayed, this is why, as Ray just said, these cities are collapsing. The, the southern, the southern uh, belt, which used to be the powerhouse and production house of America, has been wiped out. And, and this is why the minority people, they had good, well-paying jobs. That's why the black folks from the South went north. But now their, their jobs have gone and, and they're impoverished. In the meantime, we don't have the money to pay decent wages. Now in England we have a similar situation. Now you know, <laughs> a couple of examples, and, and the, the same thing is going to happen here. It's happening in England as we speak. Uh, the National Health Service, which was the, one of the glories of, of the Labour Party, is being wiped out and privatised as, as we speak. Benefits are being cut. We have people on food stamps. I mean, about five or ten years ago, there was about 30,000 people on food stamps. Now there are almost half a million. So people are actually going hungry in England as we speak. 
Because of the policies, the policies of this right-wing government we have, who love austerity. Now I have to say, Ted Cruz, who you probably love, and you know, he, he would love to bring austerity to America. Austerity economically never works. To pay off debt, you have to have a growing economy where people pay taxes. I said it many times here, we need to start businesses in this country. We don't need job centers, we need business creation centers. We need a financial system that promotes business, and puts people back to work properly. We don't need this gambling house in, in, on Wall Street. There's nothing but, I mean, all that money on Wall Street goes round and round in this circle. And, and, and do you understand how high frequency trading works? If you don't, I should look it up. Because it requires vast amounts of money from the Federal Reserve that's pumped this up. Not one penny has gone to production investment. And, th and this trade deficit cannot go on expanding year after year as it does. And by the way, as I said, I got back from England, as, as I was, of course the post office has been privatized. And guess what, American um, hedge fund has, has bought into it and has sold out making millions of dollars of profit after a few weeks, lovely. New Scotland Yard, which, which was the home of the police in London, that's been sold off for luxury flats. Um, the War Office, where Winston um, ran the war, that's been sold off to a consortium from India and Spain. Now, you know, that's how we're paying our waning, by selling stuff off. Well, same thing is happening in America. Do you know who really owns this country? Do you, I mean, do you think America really is in, in, in control of stuff? It cannot. You run this trade deficit and eventually you will not own this country. You won't be in, in control of your own affairs. And it's as simple as that. This country, both parties had to radically change it the way it does business. The, the fun, the, and the political system is a laughing stock. I mean, you know, who would set up a damn ridiculous system? You know, if we, why don't you have a proper parliamentary system? As every other country in the world has. Look up that. Why don't you have a proper manufacturing base again? Why didn't you? Why didn't you listen to Keynes during the war, and and set up um, uh, the Bancor system that he proposed? No, America thought it could, could, could go its own way as usual and shut itself in the foot. And one day here, yeah, I'll explain why and how that all happened. Okay? I mean, I find it astounding what's gone on, and you and really, I don't, I don't think I I I distrust all politicians everywhere. I mean, I don't think they're worth anything. You know, I wish they had some brains and they had education, and they don't. It's like I, I speak to lawyers, okay, and I have to tell them what the damn law is. And you have a degree in Texas, in your, in your t and I have to tell them what the damn law is. I'm, come on, I, how can I do that? I read, okay? That's all it takes. Now, you know, as I say, I've done very well here. I'm glad I came. They paid engineers in England nothing. When I came in in the 60s, they paid engineers, actually paid engineers. They paid me to come. They went and recruited me. That's why I came. You know, and times were good. Everybody was working. Times were good. And, and it could have gone on like that. But these kleptomaniacs that run this country and, and fund both parties didn't like that. Okay? Now, it's you young people that have got to you know, change this. Okay, who's next? Come on up here, who's next? You're after him. This is a, this is a hard track to follow. <laughs> well, some of the things that, oh, most everything you've said based on my study of history is basically correct. Um, when you look at the parties from the different from the vantage point, now this is the parties now. The Republican Party is totally different today than what it was in, 19, in 1960. The Republican Party had some, uh, but the policies of the Republican Party has always been to benefit the rich from the very beginning. I'm going to say some things that the Republican Party did. Uh, when Eisenhower was president, the interstate highway system was started. Disability was started during his administration. But President Isaiah was not an ideological <laughs> Republican. He was a gentleman in the Army, and being in the Army gives you a great deal, a better view of what's going on, because you have, you have to work with everyone. 
And they had a general during World War II named Montgomery was a hard general to deal with. And he was able to keep General Patton and Montgomery working together. So he was a great person to get people to do things. So those are two things happened on, in the, his administration. The Social Security program was enacted by Democrats, except for disability. Medicare and some of the assistance program, Medicaid, was by Democrats. You know, look at things that help people. The Democrats were, in, were the party in, in control at that time. Now, the background, you know, up until the 19, probably 1965, 97, because Governor Conley was a Democrat, the governor of Texas. And he fell out with President Lyndon Johnson over civil rights. And this movement from one party to the other started really after the Civil War. Uh, the South became solid the Democratic. And would you call that now realignment? And uh, then when the Civil Rights Act was passed, like in Texas, the state, great state of Texas, one I've lived in all my life, we had two Democrats in the House to vote for that bill, Brooks out of Beaumont and Gonzalez out of San Antonio. One senator, Ralph Yarber. All the rest voted against the law. And so your numbers may be right on, because a number of Republicans supported that law. So that's why I said the party, the Republican Party at that time, they were not totally, they deal with issues that sometimes had broad based effect. But the real program, big program, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Internet and Affordable Health Care Act was that I don't agree with your contents and I don't think they're correct, but you have a right to your opinion. Uh, the Affordable Health Care is designed to help those people that don't have health insurance. And those are the ones that we want to help. If you earn the minimum wage, you cannot afford health insurance. It did, did it eliminated what we had experience rating. We have community ratings. So they're going to look at large errors in setting premium rates. It doesn't change nothing for the, for the medical, the doctors that's practicing medicine, they get paid. That's why the AMA supported it. And that's why the insurance companies wanted to begin with, and, and I think they're back on board again. But the affordable health care is taking a bad rap, and some Democrats added to the bad rap that didn't know Republicans vote for it. In 2010, they ran against their own work. That's why they lost. In 2014, they ran against the president. And, you know, things, we are paying back, you know, the, the, the deficit is getting smaller. And when President Obama came into power, we had $700 billion that had been enacted. He voted for it to bail out the banks, the mortgage companies. And then, right after the end, everything was in such terrible financial condition, we had to have what they call the Economic Recovery Act, which was also beneficial. And those acts were passed, and so that attitude and the money, we still had the two wars going. And so money was going out, and he cut taxes. A part of the Recovery Act was cutting taxes. Uh, but we know cutting taxes don't solve the problem. It may give some temporary help to some people, but it doesn't solve the problems. Uh, my thing is, and I agree with most of it, American people, we as a people got to wake up. Republican Party is extremely good at themes, framing issues. They sound good. And President Bush brought in Part D, pharmacy program. It helped the pharmacy companies more than it does the people that receive it. You, you, you can't buy gap insurance like something to cover the coinsurance and deductible under that program. You cannot buy, it's illegal to buy drugs from Canada. It's illegal for the Secretary of Health and, uh, Health and Human Service to negotiate rates like the Veterans Administration does. So, but it sounds good. It sounds good. And, you know, Operation Freedom, that sounds good. But <laughs> sometimes it's not good. So we, we have got to not listen, absorb, and believe any, from either group. You can't believe everything Democrats say. You can't believe everything Republicans say. You've got to be able to think and analyze yourself and make decisions. And when Americans start doing that, then things are going to change because they will elect people who will represent people and not the rich. 
And just like you said, all the tax cuts we got, well, I mean, didn't, didn't do me no good. $300 don't help me. Uh, and so I got a couple of those when President Bush too was president. And when President Reagan gave the tax cut, uh, my family increased uh, 200%. I had twins. And the income tax that I got cut for that was $10 two, every two weeks. That didn't buy that similar. And that's what happened with broad-based tax cuts. It's a little money, and if you know, don't have any money, it's, it's great. But if you're not in that situation, it doesn't really help that much. It would be better for the government to keep it. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Come on up here. Actually, President Reagan did not cut taxes for everybody. The people at the bottom, their tax rate went from zero to 15 percent. Uh, and he, and if Obama doubles the national debt, it doesn't even come close to President Reagan's 286 percent. But regardless, Republican, Democrat, right now there's a bill. They're wanting to reintroduce the, some of the risky activities that caused the t crash in 29 and the crash in 08. And it seems like Republicans and Democrats are going to, okay, let's just do it again. And, uh, and of course, there's that ever present. Trans-Pacific Partnership that President Obama wants passed, which, from what I understand, it's basically corporate world government in the making. It's not a good deal, and uh, also Slick Willie, for the high call, I can't stand the guy. He admitted Glass Steagall. He didn't have to sign that thing. I mean, I get sick and tired of people saying, "Well." He signed it because he was, had to work with the other side. He didn't have to sign that thing. He knew what was going to happen. And he didn't have to sign the WTO trade agreement either. And he didn't have to sign NAFTA either. So, I mean, if you look at these three things, the Democrats have done more harm than the Republicans. They, they, they all stink. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they all stink. I mean, they're not doing any good for us. They're taking the country down the tubes. And uh, like I said last week, the, the American public doesn't have a clue. And they better get a clue because time's running out. All right. That's right, Jim. Okay, who's next? Is there going to be a next? Am I going to be the last man standing? I, I can't believe this. I guess I am the last man standing. Oh, well. I had something I was going to say. Ah, I got in my pocket. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank our speaker for doing a great job tonight. I thought... It's good to argue these things out and to reach consensus if possible. Uh, we have to reduce the money and influence of money on Congress. Otherwise, we'll suffer an extension of power of corporations and money interests. That, to me, is the biggest problem we have. Winston Churchill once said the Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they try everything else. America's on the decline. Our jobs went overseas. We can't support our infrastructure. We need to cut tariffs on corporations, not countries. For every product imported, we'll have a tariff equal to the difference in labor and environmental costs. Well, that's what we need to do. Then corporations would have the option to produce things here to sell here. It would be far more economical to do so. Then we could take action to reduce the hours of work per day, a six hour day and seven, eight hour day. Incidentally, that's how we got the eight hour day. It used to be a 10 hour day. 
Without reducing the pay per day, we could change the Adamson Law of the Fair Labor Standards Act to increase overtime double time so the cost of overtime would outweigh the cost of fringe benefits. Then the manager would make a determined decision for profit to hire more people instead of working existing people longer hours, which we want them to do in the first place. 25 million people could re be reemployed full time, making them taxpayers instead of tax drainers. That would straighten out our country. But before any of this can happen, we have to reduce the influence of money on congressional elections. And challengers who come have received absolutely nothing in campaign contributions for the past, past 14 years. And as corporations controlling the Congress is by definition fascism, Congress needs to act and instruct the Federal Communications Commission to require the media to provide sufficient free airtime to general elections, the last 90 days of a general election, and the incumbent and the challenger would both have free airtime. Congressmen will be able to keep their money and obtain free airtime. They'll vote for it. The end result will be a Congress that represents the people instead of those who are currently buying their vote in Washington. Then legislation can be passed to level the playing field on corporate power, improve working conditions for people Congress is supposed to represent, and have a general improvement in the United States economy without fear of the dollar being thrown off its pedestal, which we face today. So that's all I have to say. Anyway, our speaker gets the last word. He gets to comment all these comments and close the meeting. Get the last word. Well, as I said at the beginning, uh, having an hour to cover all of these, uh, all of this uh, subject is really difficult. And, uh, you know, and so many different people spoke about so many different things that it's really hard to cover that too in just a short amount of time. Um, I would like to address the uh, comment about Abraham Lincoln freeing the slaves. Abraham Lincoln first freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation, but he only freed the slaves in the states that were then in rebellion against the United States. He didn't free the sl slaves in Maryland or Delaware or Kentucky or Missouri, which had remained loyal to the Union. Lincoln, you talk about Lincoln had respect for the Constitution. Yes, I agree, he did. And that's why Lincoln realized that that Emancipation Proclamation, first of all, in order for it to take effect, you know, the Union Army would have to enforce it, and they couldn't do it everywhere. They never, in fact, they didn't here in Texas until June 19, 1865, the year, two and a half years after it was issued. But Lincoln realized that this was something that maybe did stretch the Constitution a little bit. And he was worried that, you know, after the war was over, uh, Supreme Court ruling or, you know, even Congress could, you know, say, well, okay, that uh, all those slaves are going to have to go back into slavery. That's why Lincoln fought so hard for the passage of the 13th Amendment, which was the subject of that Spielberg movie that was out recently about Lincoln. Lincoln wanted that to be a part of the Constitution. And Lincoln felt so strongly about that that he did something he didn't have to do as president. He approved that amendment when it was passed on January 31st, 1865. Presidents don't have to approve amendments to the Constitution. You may, you may or may not know this, but the states have to do that, 75% of them. And, but Lincoln wanted his name on that because he wanted, that, he wanted people to know that he was associated with that. So yes, he, he, did, he did believe in the Constitution. Lincoln was a liberal in my opinion because Lincoln saw the, the use of the power of the federal government to make sure that people have equality of opportunity, that they have a fair chance in life, that they work together as a community of people on not just the local and the state, but also the national level. He saw the need to expand the railroads, to expand education, to expand the homesteads westward. This is why I say Lincoln was a liberal, because he saw that the power of the federal government was great enough to do a great good for, for the whole country, not just for a few states. We talk about states' rights and individual liberties and things like that, and that's all very well and good, but it's, as a historian, I've seen time and time again where states' rights was simply code word for let's keep some other people suppressed in this state. States' rights was what they said in Arkansas in 1957 when Central High School was, uh, was uh, ordered by a federal court to be desegregated and they cried out about states' rights. Governor uh, Wallace of Alabama, yes he was a Democrat, but he was a conservative Southern Democrat. 
I'm talking about conservatism here. Forget the party labels. Let's talk about conservative and liberal. Wallace was no liberal, okay? He was a conservative. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's conservatism that's the problem, no matter what party happens to be embracing it at the time. Conservatism was a problem when it was the Democrats who were the conservatives, and, it was, and it's a problem now that the Republicans are the conservatives. I disagree that, there's a, that there is no difference between the two parties. I think there's a substantial difference. I first uh, got a chance to vote in a presidential election in 1972. I chose to support George McGovern for president in 1972 instead of Richard Nixon. My main reason was is because I opposed the war in Vietnam. Nixon was still going on with the war then. McGovern said, I'll end it now. And uh, yes, Nixon did bring it to a conclusion about six months or so later after that summer. But the point here is that that's why I did it originally, but nothing that has happened to me or have I experienced as a person since then has led me to regret uh, aligning myself with the Democrats or, or the progressives or liberals of the country under whatever banner they might have to go to. It just seems to me conservatism is just negative. It's always wanting to stay the same or go backwards. It's all about, let's oppose this, let's oppose that, let's not be for this. I don't understand why the Republicans don't want people in this country to have access to health care. I just don't get it. Harry Truman didn't get it either. Neither did uh, Bill Clinton uh, and President Obama. And in fact, I don't even like Obamacare myself. You know why? Because it's not national health insurance. It's still relying on the private sector. As long as you have a profit motive factored in, health insurance is going to be more expensive. If we had one single payer plan like Canada has, I think we'd be a lot better off. And I was very disappointed that the Republican, uh, President Obama allowed the Republicans to kill the public option that was on the table when Obamacare, as they call it, was first uh, 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 being proposed. I'll give you some concept. Uh, John was talking about national health insurance in England. I lived in England for five years myself. I, I know what national health insurance is about. I found that most of the people who say, oh, it's no good, have no idea of what they're talking about. My wife had a baby while we were living in England. The greatest thing about that experience for me was not just seeing, not just seeing my son born, but also not having anyone ask me when I wheeled her into the hospital in the wheelchair they came out to greet us with. Nobody asked me, can I see your insurance card? Will you come into the office and fill out some papers? Never had to do anything like that. When we left, we didn't have to stop by the business office and pay a bill. Okay? Did we pay for it? Yes, through our taxes. That's how national, that's how socialized medicine works. Recently, I had a cousin who had a heart attack. He was, he's only 40 something years old. He's a young man. But he had a heart attack and he was taken down here to the doctor's hospital. Now he didn't have any insurance. And they said, well, we'll operate on you if you can get some of your relatives to cough up $30,000. That's just to start with. That's not the whole thing. I think there's another 30 or $40,000 that he's still in debt for. But they wouldn't even talk to him about doing a heart operation until he coughed up $30,000. I have a brother-in-law who had a heart attack last year in London. In the middle of the night, it was a Sunday night, in the middle of the night, my nephew called the, uh, my uh, brother-in-law's a widower. His, uh, his son, my nephew, who lives with him, called the ambulance. They came and got him. They whisked him off to King's College Hospital in London. They operated on him that night. He's had a couple of follow-up operations. They put stents in his arteries. Nobody asked him, where's your insurance card? When he came in the hospital, nobody stuck him with a bill when he left. And people in America think private insurance in private, that's the best way to go? I don't get it. I've never gotten it. This is one reason I've, that I don't like Republicans because they just don't seem to want people to have health insurance, either private or public, and what gets me too, and this, this is Republican hypocrisy for you, the plan that President Obama put out there is basically Mitt Romney's plan 
that he used in Massachusetts. Mitt Romney, a Republican. It was a Republican plan. Obama makes it his, and the Republicans suddenly don't like it. Why? Because it's a Democrat taking uh, authorship of it now. This is the sort of thing I'm talking about when I say Republican hypocrisy. Romney is not a conservative by any means, though. We're talking, I mean, if we're strictly talking about conservative and liberal. Well, well in any case, the point is, is that uh, I just think that if you look at that list I've compiled and you look at all the things that we can put on the Republicans and generally conservative Republicans over a period of over a hundred years, on balance, and this is what I'm talking about, on balance, yeah, we can, we can come up with things that the Democrats did wrong. I agree with you. I'm ashamed of Bill Clinton for signing that glass, I mean that Graham uh, law, Graham Blyley Leach law, whatever it was. I always trip over those other two names. <laughs> yeah, I think that was wrong. I'm not a big fan of NAFTA either. I think Bill Clinton made some big mistakes. Um, I think though he had the right idea in regard to health care though, and I was really very dismayed that the Republicans shot that down. Every time there's been a a plan to bring health insurance to the, to this to the American people. The Republicans, time and again, have been the ones who have been opposed to it. I'd like to see people come up with and say, you know, let's find a way to do this. Let's try to find find a way to make this work, instead of just opposing everything. Instead of just saying no, 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 no. It just seems to me that the Republicans are the party of no. That's how it appears to me, as a person. And I just know that all the things that have that have benefited me in my life that have come out of the United States government have been largely democratic initiatives, which we, uh, one of our speakers was speaking about this, uh, a while ago. But uh, I think we could do better. And uh, anyway, I know we're not all going to agree on everything, but that's how I feel. And uh, I've never voted for a Republican in my entire life, and I don't plan to unless they make some major changes to their way of thinking. So thank you and good night. Okay, that's it. We're going to retire to the, this, we have to be out here by nine. They close at nine. Our speaker is welcome down to uh, Starbucks. We'll carry on the conversation there. We'll buy you some coffee and uh, be happy to do that. But we're all done for tonight. This is William, your videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like us or follow us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call. So when visiting the Barbex restaurant, tell them you want your reservation to the next College of Complex class.